Thank you. Yeah, you can. Yes, do it. from my side, I have to add one sentence. Okay. <laughs> this group loves Lalita. <laughs> and therefore, it occurred to me that why not introduce Lalita's guru in, in our language or Hindi or in English also these days, Lalita's teacher. So to all my members here, we are presenting Lalita's teacher. That's right. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to um, go ahead and put up my slides and uh, that will help the discussion, I hope. And, um, and perhaps we can take questions at the end if that's okay with everybody. All right, so, and then I'll just ask to screen share once I get my slides up here. So hang on one minute. Can you confirm that you can see the slides? No, we don't see them. You don't see them? No, we don't see them. Hmm. Okay. Um, let me see. Perhaps if I share them by email and then someone else can see them, I'm sorry for the definitely, delay. Definitely, you can e email the same, uh, this one, I'll be able to share the link. Yeah. Okay. All right. Give me one minute here. I apologize. Etha, I am sharing a Google link to you right now. I'm hoping that you received it by email. Give me a second, like, uh, yes, I got it. Okay, and if you could open it and yes, then just, uh, okay. Okay, I'm ready to share it. And if you could change the view to slideshow, I'm hoping everybody can see that now. Does that work for everybody? You can see it, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay. So if you could, and so I thought today's topic again, I added some um, pieces. Lalitha and I had a couple of conversations about what to talk about today. And so I thought I'd title it Diet and Nutrition Trends in 2022. And I added some additional slides to address some questions that um, someone gave me um, earlier today. So if you could just advance the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as the introduction said, you know a little bit about me already. And um, the picture to, the, um, to your left is me just outside. Um, I spend my winters, the last uh, couple of winters in Southern Florida uh, because I like to get away from the cold and the sun. Um, the middle picture, a little bit more about me, um, something that I like to do. I like to relax and see friends on a beach. And the last picture shows 
um, food. In other words, I, uh, like most dietitians, we certainly, we studied nutrition and diet, and, but most of us also tend to enjoy what we eat because food, as you know, plays such an important part. Of we don't see any our culture. culture. We don't see anything. Well, pardon me? Oh, okay. Now it's coming. Now we see oh, coming. it must be the view of, is it the view? Okay. Oh, yes, because you need to be able to click. Right, on, right. Um, I did not know that uh, we have pictures. In some of these. I apologize for okay. that. Uh, yes, if you click enter, who am I? And then um, the middle picture shows you my friends on the beach and then food, of course. <laughs> so if you want to keep going and just hit enter, that should work, Geetha. I apologize again. Um, next slide. So improving your health today, this is the outline of things that I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about. And perhaps you've had other people talk a little bit about this. Uh, we're gonna talk about your, your intestine or your gut, the particularly gut microbiome. Um, I thought it would be interesting to cover some hot topic um, in our future, and that's something called precision or personalized nutrition. Um, talk a little bit about food trends, and lastly, some diet trends and other questions to be answered. Um, if you could hit enter. So uh, looking at uh, your gut microbiome and in particular, hold on one second, my picture's coming out. Um, what does what you eat influence your uh, bacteria that live in your large intestine? And perhaps uh, we all are certainly aware that what we eat does impact you know, the bacteria that lives in our gut. Let's see, next slide. Here I have a picture that shows the changes that can happen over someone's lifetime regarding the microbiome and um, in particular, what happens when you start in the start of life. Again, a baby is uh, gut when they're born is sterile. In other words, living in the mom's womb, there is nothing, you know, there's no bacteria there. But once the baby's born, the baby gets bacteria from, again, the mom's breast milk, which has, um, you know, very healthy things. And also just actually by, uh, by being born, if you didn't know this, um, that especially when a baby is born um, naturally and not by C-section, they can get the initial bacteria from the mom's womb. As a child grows, there's an increasing amount of, of types of bacteria from different things, including food but also their environment. And as adults, um, you're pretty much, the bacteria that we have up until probably 60, 65 has been pretty well defined. In other words, um, you still, you can still change it a little bit, but usually it's already set by the environment. In other words, where you live, how you live, um, and of course, the foods and the drinks that you, you know, take in and nourish yourself. But as we get older, and that's typically at the age of 65 and older, we, there's been research that shows that the types of bacteria that live in your gut can change. And it's also, again, due to environment, diet, um, what you drink, but also uh, the use of antibiotics, you know, to treat infection can change your microbiota or again, the bacteria that live in your gut and um, other chronic health conditions can also change it. So what can we do 
uh, to, you know, possibly change or again, talking about the influences of your, on the bacteria. Well, we know that prebiotics feed your gut. Oh, I'm on, I'm sorry. Uh, Gita, if you could go to the next slide. And um, there's something called prebiotics and probiotics. And again, prebiotics is something that feed your gut microorganisms. And what I have here are two, two pictures. Again, on the left, you see all different kinds of fruits. These are, again, foods that feed the microorganisms that lie in your, in your large intestine. On the right-hand side, you have vegetables, of course. And if you click the enter button, it also shows different types of whole grains or ancient grains that feed your, your gut. So these are, again, parts of a healthy diet, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but maybe you're not aware of why we consider them healthy in this regard. If you could hit enter. So the, the next slide, Uh, is a question that often comes up. In other words, should you take a supplement? So should you take a prebiotic supplement? And the picture here shows a quick Google search that I did on prebiotic. And you can do that too. You could just type in prebiotic and see all these different bottles that are available to you. So in other words, they've packaged some of the in, in more in high concentration things found in fruits, vegetables, and whole grain, and um, put it in a pill form. If you hit enter, Gita, if yeah, it'll make the picture disappear. And if you hit enter again, the word confusing should show up. And I put this word here because supplements are confusing and prebiotic supplements are confusing. Um, what makes them confusing is what I've already talked about that there's lots of them on the market. The other confusing thing is they're not regulated. In other words, we're not sure sometimes of what's in the bottle is actually what they say is in the bottle, like have they been tested? Also, it's not, there's not a lot of research <clears throat> that shows that taking a prebiotic is helpful um, to your microorganisms, okay? <clears throat> so I guess my, my concluding advice is fruits, vegetables, whole grains. And I'm sure Lalitha has already talked about that before. <laughs> All right, next slide. Now, this one talks about probiotics. So again, prebiotics, the word pre talks about what actually feeds the microorganisms in your gut. Probiotics are the actual microorganisms. So, they contain the microorganisms. They're the beneficial bacteria for your gut health. And on this slide, I just wrote um, the groups of foods that are the most, uh, that contain the most microorganisms. And Geetha, if you could hit enter, that would be great. Um, here I show a picture of foods that I'm sure you're most familiar with. These are the healthy fermented foods in Indian cuisine. And certainly there are other fermented foods that other cuisines share, such as kimchi, tempeh, kombucha, sauerkraut. In, in all honesty, I am much more familiar with the other types of fermented foods 
And I am just now exploring Indian cuisine because I think we all can learn. And I figured since I was doing this talk, I would look a little bit more towards your, your own cuisine. So again, these are the foods that contain microorganisms. If you could hit enter, Geetha, that would be great. So should you take a probiotic supplement? And now I sound like a broken record. I did the same thing. I typed in probiotic into Google. And then this is, this is just the start of all the probiotics that are out in the market. Um, the same thing that, uh, that I said about prebiotic supplements holds for probiotic supplements. So Geetha, if you could hit enter and hit enter again, it is confusing again. And um, I even asked my daughter who is studying um, microbiota or microorganisms about taking a probiotic supplement. And she is, she highly recommends continuing to eat your fermented foods. And in her point of view, and some of the research shows, yogurt actually has the same kinds of, of good bacteria that are found in the pills. So uh, we, we really suggest taking, you know, or eating, you know, rather than supplements. Um, however, I do want to say that there are instances where taking a probiotic supplement can be helpful, but I would definitely consult your, your doctor uh, and, or, and a dietitian before, before doing something, before really taking this type of supplement. Okay. If you could hit enter, that would be great, Geetha. So the next topic that is very, uh, that you might hear something about, I think you will hear more about it in the future, is something called precision nutrition. And as this picture says, everybody responds to diet and nutrition differently. And we know that there's lots of different things that impact how we respond. So in other words, if um, one of the best examples in research is if I eat a potato and uh, Geetha eats a potato, my blood sugar would be different than Geetha's blood sugar three hours later because our genetics, our environment, and how we process a potato can have an influence on how we, you know, how that potato acts on our blood sugar, okay? So in addition, so we know all these things impact our diet and our nutrition, um, but, and so we're moving toward trying to make it very personal for each person instead of trying to make these recommendations and guidelines for, you know, for everybody thinking everybody's going to be the same way or, and, you know, going to react the same way to these recommendations. So how do we do that? Gita, if you could hit the next slide. Like I said, how are we going to figure out all this data? And maybe um, again, um, Rao talked that you had lots of other um, speakers and perhaps you had a speaker that talked about AI or something at the initial stand for artificial intelligence. And what that does is it just takes all this data like from your, from your diet and from your environment, in other words, where you live and how you live and how much exercise you get, and also some of your other uh, clinical data. In other words, your blood tests for cholesterol and sugar and maybe other conditions and feeds it into a computer and is able to use that data to then translate that into something that you can do personally. I know it's a really an amazing concept, um, but 
we are seeing more of this being used. Um, I, I do want to say before we go on, there's one, there's a recent New York Times article that came out last week on um, artificial intelligence and personalized nutrition through a telephone app. And um, I found that to be very interesting where this gentleman um, submitted his information like, so for example, to to study what your gut microbiome looks like, you actually submit a stool sample and they measure the bacteria in your stool. And then this gentleman also submitted his data for his blood sugar because he had type two diabetes and he also had hypertension, he had blood pressure problems and he, had, he was obese um, and then he submitted where he lived and they were able to customize a healthy diet for him using a tele, really an application on his telephone. And he was very motivated to follow it and, it. and it helped him. In other words, he lost weight, he improved his blood sugar, and he improved his blood pressure just by using an app. Now, and it was personalized. In other words, they just didn't give him general um, nutrition advice, they were able to customize it to his own diet and to tell him how he could eat macaroni and cheese and how he could make it more healthy and things like that. So we are, we are very close to that. It's not on the market yet, but they're trying that. Um, the, the place where we are seeing AI, which is not in food and nutrition, but uh, which is being more established now is in um, perhaps in other aspects of healthcare, like uh, reading radiology scans, which is, is very interesting. So in other words, like reading um, like uh, x-rays and MRIs, and they're, they're looking at how a computer um, is, helps the physician, but you, you still need both, okay? But, uh, but very interesting um, applications, so, all right. Ethan, next slide. Um, for fun, I thought I'd just share a little bit of the what we think are the food trends in this country um, for this year. Um, maybe, I'm sure you've heard about some of these in the newspaper. Um, you'll still hear more about it. The whole idea of sustainability, going green. Um, I understand in New York City now, they charge you if you want to use a plastic bag, uh, but it's very, very much uh, going countrywide that we're gonna, you know, force people to use um, reusable shopping bags, reusable storage bags, believe it or not. Composting, which has a food and diet um, application. Uh, they're trying to make food composting more, uh, you know, more accessible for people, uh, easier to use. Uh, you're seeing more plant-based products. Um, and so not just eating regular, you know, salads and other vegetables, but obviously turning those vegetables into something else that more, uh, more people in this country would eat. For example, uh, we, we've had plant-based hamburgers on the market for years for people that still wanna eat hamburgers. Now you're seeing plant-based chicken that's coming on the market, believe it or not. Plant-based fish, I, 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 that's, I find that amazing too. Uh, so other, like I said, other plants uh, being used. Uh, and the last one that's interesting, I think, is coffee alternatives. And the reason why we're looking at coffee alternatives is because of the pandemic and climate change being able to source coffee or get coffee beans for people to drink coffee is becoming much, much more difficult. So they're looking at other types of product that can be used as a coffee alternative. And it's not just tea leaves. Okay, so uh, very interesting. Uh, if you want to hit enter. And here you'll see, um, a dish that's being highlighted actually in a New York City restaurant. 
So uh, I thought you would, and again, for this audience, you would find this uh, very interesting. Indian cuisine is the hot cuisine for 2022. So we expect to see more regional Indian restaurants, particularly in New York, and perhaps moving even to the other coasts. So I thought you would enjoy hearing about that. You're on, you're on trend. So, all right, enter. Thanks, Geetha. So here's some other questions I was asked to address um, from uh, a couple of other people that uh, arranged for this talk. Um, does what you eat impact your mood or your mental health? And lots and lots of research into that, especially um, I think we're gonna see more in relationship to uh, our, our pandemic and what people have been experiencing and then the short answer is yes. Um, what we eat certainly can influence our mood, uh, but there's again, lots of other factors that impact mental health. Um, here I just feature a major category of, of, of foods that have been studied. Um, here on the left, I say use healthy fats. This picture um, shows you again, <clears throat> what we consider to be healthy fats, um, fats found in fatty fish. You see salmon, you see mackerel. Um, I know that salmon is much more prevalent in the supermarkets than perhaps mackerel, uh, but canned fish can also be a really good source of healthy fat besides avocado, nuts, and then avoiding highly processed fats that can also uh, impact your mental health. There's been lots and lots of research looking at supplements and mental health. Uh, the research is, it's not clear cut. Um, in other words, by just taking an omega-3 fatty acid supplement, can that help your mood? And the research shows, it goes in both directions. Um, so because of that, um, you'll see that's why I put pictures of, again, real food. Um, there certainly has been good research looking at avoiding highly processed foods. Um, in addition to, you'll see there, there's donuts and chips in that picture and um, like store-bought cookies, um, things, store-bought crackers that fall in that category. And for people that eat a lot of those, if they're able to change their diet and avoid those, they do tend to feel better. Um, other aspects of diet that we've already discussed that can impact your, your how you feel, again, is um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains. Okay, if you could hit enter, that would be great. Let me see here. Um, what I've shown here are five uh, diet trends in the future, or well, what they predict for, um, again, th that are going to be popular this year. And the first one, which I, I do like to highlight, if you haven't heard about it before, is um, the MIND diet, the Mediterranean diet. DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay diet. Um, and I have a slide on that next that we'll talk about. Other things that are, are being talked about or again promoted this year are the immune enhancing diet. Um, that's again a diet that um, stresses more fruits and vegetables because they contain something like it's um, antioxidants that, pr that promote immune function. Um, the idea of intuitive eating, um, if you've not heard of that type of a diet, it's, um, I will tell you, it's very popular in, uh, certainly in my former students um, over the last five years, trying to practice this and also promote it in our clients. 
where you're you're listening to your own body cues for when you're hungry and when you're full and trying to take your mind off of these other um, ideas about diet that have not worked very well in the past. In other words, uh, you know, again, trying to promote more healthy eating, but again, intuitive eating is trying to be more mindful of, of cues of hunger and fullness. Keto, the keto diet is um, very popular. It's an offshoot of the Atkins diet. It's one where um, it's very uh, heavy in proteins, fats, and then um, watching how much complex carbohydrates and other carbohydrates that you eat. Um, it's certainly a diet that's not for everyone, but again, this is still a trend in this country. And lastly, I mentioned intermittent fasting. Um, intermittent fasting means you go for periods without eating, and then of course, uh, times when you do eat. The fast can be anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. That's been studied. We do, uh, there is good literature to support uh, weight loss and better metabolic health with some form of intermittent fasting. However, the research is out, it's, it's unclear in terms of the length of time that you need to fast to make these, you know, to have this improve your health. Um, so there are people that do, you know, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours of fasting. But again, if you are thinking about doing something like this, you need to, again, talk to your doctor uh, before trying this on your own, okay? Uh, we can hit enter. I win some money. Win some money. I put this picture up because it talks about the mind diet again, um, and there are certainly diet aspects that we've talked about already that are part of this. For again, mental health and in incorporating parts of the Mediterranean diet. Um, here, these are the eight top foods to eat for your brain. And those would be, um, if you wanna take a minute to look at the picture. I don't think I need to read that to you. Next slide, Geetha. So another question that came up ahead of time is, can you prevent muscle loss from uh, through diet? And uh, this has been a topic uh, for a number of years. Um, when I say a number of years, the literature goes back to goes back at least 10 years, upwards of 12 years. And um, particularly for people that are over the age of 65, um, we know with aging that there's a natural loss of muscle um, and it's, it's due to uh, a number of things, which include things that are out of, you know, that happen physiologically um, from, from hormone stuff. So, uh, so there are things that you can do in your diet to help prevent muscle loss. And uh, most important would be getting enough protein in your diet. Um, a lot of research has focused on how much protein should you eat in your diet for those over the age of 65. Um, the current recommendations are uh, only um, 0.8 to like one gram 
per kilo of body weight. Um, but again, lots of research now of protein. So for example, if you are somebody that weighs approximately 130 pounds, uh, 0.8 turns into about 50 is about two ounces of meat fit. That may not be enough. The recommendation, I will tell you that the official recommendations have not changed. People over the age of 65 may need maybe almost twice as much of that per day. Okay. So that's can't prevent muscle loss. And that's why I have a picture of an older woman doing a little weightlifting there. And we do, it is fairly well established that you need some type of weight bearing exercise um, and resistance training to prevent. And actually you can gain back some muscle loss as, as you age. Uh, next slide, enter. So I was asked a question, what, you know, what are the sodium or what's the salt recommendations after you have heart surgery? And here I, I just wanted to put up what the current sodium recommendations are for everyone. Um, and um, this would be for people that have had heart surgery, but it's also for people overall to, uh, for everyone in this country, pretty much. And that is the current recommendations are no more than um, 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day and trying to work toward 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. Okay, so I'm not sure if that's lower than what you think, uh, but that these types of recommendations can improve your blood pressure and it definitely improves heart health. And the last thing that I wrote on this slide was that salt and sodium are not the same thing, okay? And that salt is 40% sodium uh, because the, you know salt is made up of sodium and chloride. So you have to, um, the best thing to do is to read nutrition labels, you know, the labels on the back of the packages if you want to figure out how much that is. Or again, if you eat less processed food, you will naturally eat less sodium. Okay. We can hit enter, Geetha. So are there foods that can help you sleep better? Um, again, lots of hot topic, right? Very hot topic, um, lots of research. Um, if you look at um, research and certain guidelines, uh, there are some foods that contain melatonin, which can help sleep. Um, and those are foods that I've listed here. Uh, so it's not controversial, okay? Uh, but, uh, but sleep is, um, you know, again, it's not just food that impacts sleep. I'm sure you're all well aware of that too. But other food and drink related advice that's um, published again in research, uh, again, I, I'm sure you're all well aware of limiting your caffeine, um, trying not to eat or drink too late if possible. Too late is described, trying to eat and drink at least three hours before going to bed. So that's, that's the definition. And lastly, moderate alcohol consumption. Now the term moderate is again, uh, not clearly defined, um, but we can answer more specific questions about that if anybody has that. If you hit enter, that pretty much concludes everything that I've uh, had prepared. Um, again, that's another picture of me enjoying a very good meal. <laughs> and uh, again, something that I like to do. Uh, and I'm not sure if there, and again, thank you for asking me to come and talk. And I'm more than happy to try to answer any other questions that I may not have addressed in this, in this discussion. And Geetha, thank you for operating the enter button. <laughs> Hello? 
Hello? Yes, so what is what what food is good to eat at night to go to sleep? I understand we don't uh, drink caffeine, we don't take caffeine, and we eat three hours before uh, going to sleep. But what food is good to make us go to sleep? What would you well, suggest? What do I suggest? So you want so you're trying to figure out what to eat for dinner? That would yeah for dinner like it, you know. Not for dinner, like anything like which can make me feel go go to bed, like you know, I can have a sound sleep. Beside yeah. the vitamins I take, I take melatonin. You do take melatonin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I said, anything unfortunately, there there's if you if you look at what's uh, published or what's in the literature, there it, there really is no one food that makes you go to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really wish there were. I, uh, on, a, on a personal note, uh, I have a few sleep issues myself and I, I actually try to focus on the non-food stuff. Maybe you have already done that too, like other, other habits to try to promote sleep. Um, if okay. anybody else I do I I I mean I do sleep and then I do the meditation which helps me I guess that's the only way <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely okay. thank um, you there's yeah there's there's research actually too for like climate in other words like making sure that your room if you have control over the temperature is mm -hmm. is cool um, they're even suggesting 65 degrees which is, mm -hmm. which is very difficult in Florida, by the way. Uh, but they suggest 65 degrees, and now they're coming up on the market with cooling pillows, if you can believe that, because they think that can help. Uh, the type of sheets that you use on your bed can also help, because oh, one food is not going to work. Yeah. OK, so I have to go shopping for sheets and pillows now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. It's a nice out today. Maybe I will think about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have Kishan. 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 Uh, one minute, Rita Ji. I'll add Kishan, Uncle. Go ahead. Hello, Ms. Markel. Thank you for coming over and giving us a suggestion, advice on nutrients and diet and was happy and glad to see you with uh, you eating a healthy meal. It was tempting, <laughs> it was good. Question I have is like uh, you suggested about the pre-biometric and pro-biometric supplements. Uh, is there any side effects on it? If we do that. Yes, uh, so on the, on the plus uh, side, so I've, I've done uh, with other, you know, I helped with some research with prebiotic supplements. And the reason why I, uh, the, the things that are in the prebiotic supplement can actually make uh, some people feel worse if they have a condition called irritable bowel syndrome or IBS because right. those supplements have fibers in them that irritate those people. Uh, so, and I, I really didn't know that years ago. So for example, my husband has IBS. He took that supplement, a supplement, because he thought it would help. And unfortunately it made everything worse. So that's the, that, that would be the biggest caution I have for a prebiotic supplement. Now, in regards to a probiotic supplement, those, those uh, microorganisms, the, the difficulty with that supplement, or there's a couple of things. One, uh, those, if you're going to make it, you're going to find one that's been um, reviewed or that has, um, that's been uh, that has a label on it that it's been regulated because oftentimes those supplements don't have the amount of bacteria in them that they say it does. 
The other problem with that supplement, and not problem, but the other uh, disadvantage of a probiotic supplement is that they get they can be digested in the stomach and you're not sure how much actually gets into the large intestine, which is where the bacteria live. So if you eat fermented food or if you eat yogurt, or if you're thinking about eating fermented food or yogurt, which is not a bad, that would be a good idea. We know that the bacteria in those products is as much or more than what's in those pills. And that can get into the large intestine easier than the pill. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the only thing the suggestion I advise uh, maybe I need a feedback from you, <clears throat> not uh, blaming you. I know a lot of uh, scientists and uh, doctors, they throw us all the numbers and percentage uh, about all uh, uh, nutrients and mineral, minerals and vitamins, uh, percentage wise and number wise and milligrams, so much we had to eat. But being a senior citizen and being an Indian uh, background, we don't eat much uh, outside food. We cook uh, mostly at uh, home and we don't drink much. So basically, if we eat controlled meals, I don't think we have to worry about the percentage or numbers you all throw us at us. Right. I think you are. If, if all of you eat and cook, the way that you say you all eat and cook and you don't buy potato chips or donuts or don't eat too many of them right, or right, processed right. crackers, then yes, you are, you are fine. Absolutely. You don't need to worry about the numbers at all. And so uh, if you, you know, if I, I don't know if you already eat some fermented food, you're again, you're, you're doing no. a lot better. No, not yet. Oh, well, you know, you can decide that for yourself. <laughs> right, right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask next yes, question? Yes, Sarita please go ahead. When we go to the nutritious market or, you know, where they sell vitamins, I buy calcium and calcium with the cannot be absorbed without vitamin D. And there are so many options, vitamin D4 or some other numbers, which one is best? Which kind of vitamin D should we buy it with the calcium? You know, that is a very, that is a very good question. Unfortunately, I do not have the answer to that one at my fingertips. If Lalitha is on that call, on this call, and if she knows, <laughs> I will ask her to bail me out. Okay. <laughs> I'm not hearing from Lalitha, so, um, but I am more than happy to research that because that is a very good question. And I will email Geetha the answer and perhaps she can pass that on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Great. You. Okay. you have given a very, very important information to us today. It, it will be very helpful and it is really great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes. Uh, is there any other questions? Like if you have any other questions, please unmute yourself. Mm. Any other questions? I don't see any raising. Gita ji, I have one question. Yes, Neelam ji, please. Yes, hi. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the great uh, information. I, my husband had just uh, got a heart surgery like uh, about uh, 10 days ago. So what is 2300 mg sodium? How many spoons? <laughs> like, Is that one spoon salt? Uh, how, how big is your spoon? Like teaspoon. That's a good question. Uh, that, that's yeah. Yeah. So how about this? I, because I do know this number off the top of my head, one uh, quarter teaspoon, 
one quarter okay. teaspoon. Okay, one quarter. one quarter teaspoon is over 500 milligrams oh, okay. of sodium. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so uh, how do you, do you mind me asking, how do you use your salt in your food? Right now, I'm not using salt. Uh, instead of salt, I'm using lemon. So right now, I'm not oh. using salt. So, but uh, okay. So you don't use uh, right now. I'm not using for so a no, of days. no salt. But in case I have to give it, so so half a mm -hmm. quarter a spoon is five hundred sodium. Right. It it is. Yeah. Again, most of the salt that people take in is is from processed food. That's where you can get lots and lots. So yeah, if you right. don't use that, if you're just doing all home cooked meals, home you are doing you are doing okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I don't uh, need to. I should not put salt now or in his uh, in his dish. So I should not be putting salt. I, like I, for a couple of days, he. I'm not put, using salt at all. Yeah, that that is that's good. Yep. Okay, then I can continue with that. Okay, how about this omega three? Yes. Some people told me omega three fish this capsule is good for heart, but I have to check with the doctor. I would definitely check with the doctor. Okay. Thank yes. You. And how about this salt substitute? <clears throat> <clears throat> they have salt substitutes. Okay, so yes, yeah, salt <laughs> substitutes are are okay, but that's again something that you need to uh, talk about with a doctor because uh, if if the person has kidney problems, then um, a salt substitute may not be the right thing to do. Okay, because a salt substitute has a different mineral in it that might cause people with kidney problems uh, a problem. So everything has side effects. <laughs> well, unfortunately, yes. Now, but if you ask me about using like Mrs. Dash, like mm -hmm. a different dried herbs, those are fine. All dried herbs are fine. Mrs. Dash. But they don't have salt in it. They are just no salt. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. No. Rao, like you want, you have. Yes. Thank, Good. thank you very much for such a diverse topic that we have heard from several people, but you have added very good new information. My request is this, you have trained probably hundreds of students so far, if not thousands, I don't know. Can you please? Right, more like mine. <laughs> yeah. Can you please suggest us the cutting edge kind of activity, artificial intelligence based testing apps, the example that you gave somebody could manage their condition well. Can you suggest somebody who we can use for our members to see that we get the practical benefits, not just the theory. If you can suggest anyone, we'll be glad to invite them. I, I will think about that, Dr. Rao. <laughs> and I have, uh, yes, it, it will be, you know, possibly former colleagues or something to talk about where we're going in, in the future with, uh, with this artificial intelligence. I think uh, in the next five years, you're going to see more. Uh, it's, they're developing certainly the algorithms behind, you know, what, you know the, the equations to put into that type of computer program and to see what, you know, what will help each individual person because uh, like, like you said, we make, so for example, we make this general guideline about sodium, right? But we know that not, not everyone 
is going to react the same way, right? Yes, maybe some exactly people what, need less that, sodium. Right? Maybe some people can get away with that. Yeah. So we don't, yeah. But maybe, yep, I'll have to check and see if we have somebody. Because whatever is available today, mm -hmm. that can be applied, even if it is 60% success rate, mm -hmm. we would like to, I personally would like to experiment and present mm -hmm. to the group. Mm -hmm. I agree. And also we request you to send the presentation so that the same along with your recorded audio will be used. Please send us the presentation in the PowerPoint format. Will do. I can do Thank that. You. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Yes. Uh, is there any other question? Otherwise, time is running out. Uh, uh, let's check one more time. If any of you have any other questions, please unmute yourself and uh, you can ask Ms. Teresa. I have a quick and fast uh, question for you. Yes. It's about the salt. We use it uh, on a daily basis. And we are, as a senior citizen, we are cutting down the salt uh, because of blood pressure and heart. But isn't it true also that all different spices we use, uh, it contains the salt also, small percentage? Um, I would, you know, I would have to look at the spice blend that you're using. If you're, if you're using just a pure plant, like a pepper as a spice. Like for example, then, term, like for example, uh, turmeric, a uh, cinnamon powder, a uh, uh, cumin powder, something like that. No, those, those spices should be sodium free. Oh, okay. All right. You should be absolutely fine, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I think uh, I don't see anyone else, Miss uh, Teresa. It was wonderful, wonderful, like information which you gave it to our seniors. Uh, definitely, I will suggest. I mean, like uh, Indian food. When we are talking about Indian food, as you mentioned, the probiotic food, dosa and idli, it was in your menu. Uh, I would like you to go and try those uh, food. It's it's very yummy. You love it. Thank you. I I do intend to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for.